Welcome back to Black Cat Crypto Club. I'm Drake. Now, we're, we are down. Bitcoin's down today. Um, so what is going on? A lot of people, um, at least on, on Twitter and Facebook, are freaking out. Uh, we've got this little blip down today. And so what's going on? Well, it's not just the crypto market. We see the Dow is down today. The S&P 500 is down today. The Nasdaq's is down today. Everything's down today, guys. And the reason for that is because, guess what? We have another FOMC, another Federal Reserve meeting tomorrow. And like I've said in the past, right before these Federal Reserve meetings, the speculative, uh, delicate, flittery trading money in the markets always likes to flitter around and does a little dance. So that's kind of what's going on. But I do have a lot of information to go over today about the Federal Reserve, about the economy, all of these things coming into play that is going to make for an in interesting several uh, months into the future. So I'm going to get going um, through all of that today and more. There's some news. But before we do that, as always, guys, today is my last day, sadly, showcasing Emory Farm Sanctuary. So if you haven't already, please go donate a few dollars to these guys. It's a 501c company, so it's uh, it's also a tax break for you if you donate anything to these guys. And it's a small sanctuary, so any little bit that you donate over to these guys really goes a long way to help these abused and abandoned animals that they're caring for. So please do that. I also did do that raffle this month for Emory Farm Sanctuary um, with their help, actually. And so I will be drawing from this bucket, the raffle ticket bucket, and we'll be uh, awarding the winner at the end of this video. So stick around for that. Now, what is going on? I wanted to show you guys a little bit. We're going to hop over to TradeView and just look at what Bitcoin is doing. You can kind of see, like I said, today we've we've had this this red candle going down it's not really that bad though um when you zoom out i mean if i zoom out here guys to the beginning of like 2023 i mean we've this is this is nothing and if if you've listened to my videos much at all um over the last little while you'll know that this this green line here was when the halving happened for bitcoin and you'll know that i've i've always said that we we kind of trade sideways and sometimes slightly down after the halving for several months and then we hit that um that supply shock that the bitcoin having does to Bitcoin. And that's when we go into crypto summer and crypto fall and things just go crazy. So don't be discouraged right now. All we're really doing, if you look at it, all we're doing right now is really just trading sideways in this channel. So like I said, during the halving, Several months after the halving, we usually just kind of have this sideways, boring action. And it's not fun, but guys, don't get shaken out. You'll be extremely happy once that having short uh, supply shock kicks in. So don't be shaken out over this by any means. It's, it's probably just going to be a boring few months, I would imagine. Um, so go outside, touch some grass, like they say, and yeah, I mean, this actually, you know, one thing you've got to consider is lately <laughs> there has been a lot of 
but a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. A lot of this having to do with government uh, moves on Bitcoin and Bitcoin companies, the FCC filing Wells notices, and the Department of Justice going after um, Satoshi Wallet and the FBI and all of this. Um, I don't know what this is. Um, but there's been a lot of FUD, and this is so, so apparent when you go over to crypto Twitter or in, into Facebook, and people are just freaking out, panicking all over the place. And so the, the fact that the market has just stayed sideways <laughs> with all of this FUD out there is pretty remarkable, honestly. I can't remember, maybe early 2023, we had this kind of FUD, but honestly, maybe not even this much back then. And the fact that the market is just doing this sideways action is pretty remarkable in my opinion. So it just goes to show Bitcoin's resiliency there. In my opinion, there is not nothing to sell over right now, but let's get into some of the Federal Reserve stuff now that's going on. Um, I did report a little bit of this earlier last week, but this is this just happened Friday, guys. So Republic First seizure uh, signals more bank failures to come, expert warns. Republic First just failed and was seized by the FDIC late Friday afternoon. And it's funny because, I mean, it's not funny, but it's interesting because if you remember, I covered the FOMC meeting, this last meeting that they had, and Jerome Powell was asked a very weak question by a, a journalist, by one journalist. Out of the entire Q&A, one journalist asked one weak question about the banking system. And Jerome Powell said, we continue to monitor the banking system. It's something that we keep a watch on, but we, we don't see any cracks in the banking system. We don't foresee any more bank failures. And... <laughs> This comes less than, than six weeks right before the next FOMC meeting. So it will be interesting to see what he says about this, if they even acknowledge it at all. But this, again, like this says, um, signals more bank failures. And I'm just going to scroll down here a little bit. Republic First is the bank that just, just failed on Friday, but we also saw uh, several months ago, First Republic failed. So two, two different banks. Um, I don't know why this is playing, uh, but these are two different banks that have failed, very similar names, but two separate banks that have failed in the last little while. Now scrolling down here, you can see commercial real estate and this is the big sector that has been making a lot of banks fail is commercial real estate uh, foreclosures. And it jumped 117% in March. So yeah, there's big, big problems for regional and small banks. Uh, really, really big, big issues that are gonna be happening here. You can see uh, last year we had Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank went under First Republic, again, that very similar named bank, but different signature bank. All of these collapsed last year. Then we've got New York Community Bank, which it actually talks about right here. In January, New York Community Bank fell under pressure over concerns about its exposure to the beleaguered commercial real estate sector, but NYCB was able to raise $1 billion last month from investors. And so they've been bailed out essentially for the time being. 
but this is going to take more than investors bailing out uh, the banking sector at this point. Um, like I said in that last FOMC video that I made covering that last FOMC meeting, the Fed likes to claim that they have a dual mandate, right? Like they have um, their dual mandate is the economy protecting and and ensuring the economy and their second mandate is to keep inflation low. Now they claim that's their mandate, but like I said in that last video, their main, their prime directive is, and really their survival, is maintaining consumer confidence in the banking system. If they don't maintain consumer confidence in the banking system, then they lose all power that they have. So that really is their prime mandate. Now they can claim that they want to do whatever with, with inflation and the economy secondhand, but that all takes a back seat when it comes to the banking system. Make no mistake about that. So when we see banks failing, we know that the Federal Reserve has to do something about that. So let's get into uh, the news that we saw last week was that the GDP and the economy failed, uh, you know, they came in less than half of expectations. So we're seeing very stagnant economy, if not declining economy, uh, but we've seen inflation the last two times increase. So we have increasing inflation and decreasing or stagnating economy. So what, what we need to do is we need to look into the Keynesian economics and because the Fed operates very much inside a Keynesian economic uh, like mindset, right? So if you don't know what Keynesian economics is, is uh, uh, John Keynes, um, the kind of founder of this, this economic idea, he lived through the Great Depression and the Roaring Twenties. So in the Roaring Twenties, we saw the economy just going through the roof, inflation just following, and then at some point we reached that pinnacle and things broke, and that's when, in 1929, the stock market crashed and we went into the Great Depression. So what you've got to think about is the economy in this kind of wave form, where, it, where the economy goes up and then we crash down. And what Keynes said and what Keynesian economics is, is basically squashing those waves down. So we don't have the roaring truck 20s where the economy just gets out of control, inflation gets super bad, and then we go even deeper into a deep uh, Great Depression like we did back then. So his idea was we need to squash that down. When, when we're at the bottom of this, the curve, uh, at our bottom of this threshold that they've set, uh, the government needs to start spending the, the money. Uh, there needs to be monetary loosening and we need to stimulate the economy. So when we're at the bottom, we need to stimulate the economy with money printing and the like. And when we get to the, that upper threshold that they see as out of control and when inflation gets to that top point, that's when the Fed needs to come in and tighten monetary policy and, and send inflation essentially down. Now, they don't really care if the economy keeps going up. That's awesome. But usually when monetary policy tightens, we see inflation go down, but we also see economy go down. The economy and inflation usually, um, you, usually moves fairly in tandem. But like I said, with these last few readings, we have 
the GDP and the economy going down and inflation going up. So we see this bifurcation. And this is why the Federal Reserve is in a very tight spot with what they're going to do. You know, do they ease? Do they, do they loosen monetary policy so that the economy doesn't crash? Or do they tighten monetary policy so they can bring inflation down? <laughs> now, that's the big question. What, what are they going to do? And in my opinion, here's my opinion on what they do. And this is based on history. So if we look back to the 70s and the 80s, we have this same exact thing that was happening back then. We had the economy stagnating and we saw inflation going absolutely crazy. We got up to, in 1980, inflation hit like, 14%, which is bigger than what we saw in, even in 2022, maybe, <laughs> because they had a different uh, gauge back then. And that's really what this comes down to. And this is what I think is going to happen again, was CPI is the main, uh, is the Fed's preferred metric on inflation. This is the metric that they, they use most often to decide whether they need to cut or, or stimulate what they do with monetary policy. But back in the 80s, when we had stagflation going on, what they did was they did something pretty dirty. And what they did was they took housing out of CPI. Now, CPI is a basket of needs based inflation. So they took out one of the most key needs, housing, out of CPI. And that made them look fantastic because all of a sudden inflation was back to normal, you know, and it's it headed down and it, it came back into flux. Now, they made a really in my in my opinion, a poor excuse for for um, removing housing. They said housing's too volatile to keep in in CPI, which is, in my opinion, a load of garbage. You know, when has the the Fed meets every six months? Now, when has housing been so volatile that from six uh, six weeks? pardon me, I think I said six months, but the Fed meets every six weeks. And when has housing been so volatile that it's, it's just out of control from six weeks time frame that they can't, you know, they can't handle that volatility. It has never been that volatile. If it was, you'd literally never be able to sell a house during volatility like that because you'd list a house and Houses take six weeks to sell. So if things were so volatile that you couldn't gauge things during a six week period, I, I don't know. It was complete garbage uh, excuse on taking housing out of CPI. What they really wanted to do was they wanted to manipulate the numbers, numbers and they gained, they did it. You know, they gained, it worked. Um, a lot of people bought it, bought that excuse, and we got back to that 2% inflation, which is still crazy in my opinion, but we got back to those lower inflation rates without housing, <laughs> and everybody was happy. So, you know, it is what it is, but that's what I see happening. That is my opinion on what will happen uh, coming up in the next six months, year, what what we'll see is we'll see. Um, I think we'll we'll either see inflation coming down uh, because they've manipulated the numbers some way or the other, just like they did back in the eighties. Or a lot of economists are saying no, they'll just have to pivot, and four percent will become the new. 
on inflation. And that might be the case as well, but I think if they if they can manipulate the numbers and save face, that's probably what they'll do. But one thing's for sure is they're not going to let the banks fail. Now, they don't have to cut rates to make the banks uh, to stimulate the banks. What they did last year was they opened up a lending window where the banks could take very cheap or free money out uh, uh, of the Federal Reserve to survive. Now that closed in February and that's why we're seeing more and more banks failing since then. But they could open that window again, stimulate the banks. But essentially what that does is it injects money into the, into the economy to save these banks specifically. But it will increase, like we will see an increase in uh, inflation because of that. Because there is this influx of liquidity, influx of money. Money printing will be happening. Uh, it'll just be specifically for the banks so they don't have to touch the rates. Now that's a possibility or they could, you know, just manipulate the, the CPI numbers and then they, they'll be seen as uh, getting inflation under control and that's when they'll be able to cut and save GDP and the economy as well as the banking system. So either way, I don't see inflation <laughs> I don't see inflation being the main thing that they're going to be concerned with. But it will be interesting to see what Jerome Powell says tomorrow about all of this. Um, last FOMC meeting, he kind of surprised everyone because we did see CPI came out just like three days before the FOMC meeting that time. And we did see inflation going up but three days later at that FOMC meeting, Jerome Powell came out and surprised everyone and said, oh, we think in inflation's still under control, even though these recent numbers are going up. We still think it's under control and we do see the possibility of cutting rates three times this year. So he could come out and surprise everyone like that if we do expect all of the markets to go up. Um, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what he says. I He's not going to raise rates. He's not going to cut rates tomorrow. Rates will stay the same more than likely. So don't expect, expect much there. It'll be a big nothing burger as far as rates are concerned. But we will have to watch his language and his outlook on on tightening or easing in the future. And as always, what I always look for is, is anything he has to say about the, the banking system, because again, that's their prime. That's really their prime directive. So anything he says about the banking system, I would be highly disappointed with all the journalists if they don't mention this recent banking failure. I can't imagine that they wouldn't mention that, but you never know that the, there was a lot of things happening two times, two, two meetings before, and everybody just kind of ignored it. It wasn't even mentioned. So you never know what, what's going to go on with the banking thing, but that's something I'll definitely be watching for is any, any kind of talk about the banking system. Now, you know, like I said, more than likely inflation will continue to be out of control. And so what does that do? I mean, to society as a whole and the economy? Well, what it does is it punishes, it, it hurts the people that don't have assets, right? Because assets will inflate with inflation. So the rich, the upper class is highly allocated to assets. 
They've got several homes. They've got uh, stocks and bonds and all, all of these assets. So when inflation goes up, it's actually good for them because their wealth increases. Now, the middle and lower class are less allocated to assets. They've got less homes, they, if any homes. They've got you know, less stocks. And so they're disproportionately affected by inflation. And the, what ends up happening when inflation goes up is the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. And eventually, you know, we've seen over the last several decades, I mean, there's almost no middle class anymore. So we've seen this depletion of the middle class, the poorer getting poorer and the richer getting richer. And that is when the real fireworks happen. Um, this is when you get populism and you get people at each other's throats. Um, so strap in. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. Like Hunter S. Thompson said, buy the ticket, take the ride. Uh, I would just add, if you're going to buy the ticket, make sure you're paying Bitcoin. <laughs> Actually, don't buy, don't buy the ticket with Bitcoin. Use that useless fiat trash and buy the ticket, take the ride. No, guys, but... Um, you know, another thing with inflation is the rich oftentimes are living off of their investments. The middle class and the lower class are wage. Um, they're, they're living on a wage that's paid out in dollars. So unless you are receiving yearly raises at the, at the um, rate of inflation, you're actually taking a pay cut in your purchasing power. So you you might it it might seem like you're staying fairly the same. You're still getting, you know, that $20 an hour or whatever you're receiving. But according to inflation, you're actually taking a pay cut. So just another way that inflation really kind of disproportionately slams the middle and lower class. And so it's just it's not good for the underdogs and that's who this channel is for. So not good for us. So what, what can we do? Well, you get out of fiat, you know, you get out of that inflationary money and Bitcoin is obviously the fastest horse. It's not, I mean, not even really a debate. It outperforms every other class of, of asset that we've seen over the last 5, 10, 15 years um, that Bitcoin's been in existence. So not only does it outperform every other asset class, but guys, the reason it is so good for the middle and lower classes is you can buy Bitcoin for, you can buy as little of Bitcoin as you want. If you want to buy $5 worth of Bitcoin, you can do that. You can't do that with other asset classes like real estate or stocks. You have to buy in full uh, units, like you have to buy an entire house or uh, uh, an entire stock. So you can't just buy five, ten dollars here or there. So it really is a better asset for the the poor and the middle classes. Um, it's just it's just more uh, equal. I guess, more equally available to everyone. And so it really works out well, according to that. But it's also a very homogenous asset. So if you're buying gold or, or any other commodity, if you buy in the US, you're getting a higher quality product than if you buy in Nigeria. If you buy gold here in the U.S., it's going to have more purity than if you buy in a third world country. So it's another way that Bitcoin really services the, the lower classes because you're getting a homogenous, um, homogenous um, asset. You know, one Bitcoin here in the U.S. is the same exact product 
that you're getting in a third world country. So again, just another way that it benefits the, the lower classes um, better than any other asset out there. So guys, again, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's the answer, not financial advice, obviously, but it just, it just is. It just is the mo most superior asset out there, especially for us underdogs. So again, guys, don't get shaken out by the sideways action. I know it's extremely, extremely boring, um, if not, you know, depressing because these small moves down are, it just seems like the, it's, it just seems more proportionately depressing than it is euphoric during these these sideways actions so don't get shaken out we are coming upon um a very good time in the next year year and a half or so um so yeah hold strong now let's get into this raffle guys let's pick from this this uh these raffle tickets See who wins the portrait of their pet pet. And it is gonna be Andrew M. <laughs> Congratulations, Andrew. You get a portrait of your pet. So I will be getting with you uh later, and I'll also be letting Emery Farm know so they'll be able to get that portrait out to you. But guys, again, nothing to sweat in in all of this price action. Don't get butted out. Go out, touch some grass, get your minds off the market. Don't be checking your portfolio every 10 seconds during these, these insanely boring sideways times. But I will always be here um, trying to bring you guys the best um, information. Uh, the most educational information. And uh, again, I will be doing, I'll probably be doing a live stream tomorrow um, on that FOMC meeting. So guys watch for that. It'll be interesting to watch that and see what Jerome Powell says in that, in the, in that Q and A afterwards. So anyways, I will see you in the next video. Bye.